Good afternoon and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. For the first time in my professional career, I was given an opportunity to tour a facility that manufactures ion engines and is also working on next generation propulsion. Never had an opportunity like that before and got to see all kinds of technology that I had never seen before as well and learned a lot about all of that. And I would like to make a couple of acknowledgments. First of all, I would like to thank Joel Ryder. Um, his company came out actually unexpectedly to film on a second day when we had an opportunity to also speak uh, with the lead engineer at Pulsar Fusion, which really added to the completeness of the video and also a lot of extra technical details and especially I would like to extend my deepest thanks to uh, ASN another space nut uh, also his name is Aaron who did amazing work not only coming all the way down here from Yorkshire in order to uh, film all of this in Milton Keynes but also editing just about all of this video and you're going to see that that this is all very different and a hell of a lot more professional than what I have to do and I want to extend my my deepest thanks to Aaron and of course to Joel as well. Let's get on to the tour right now. guys it's time to introduce you uh, to uh, the man in charge of everything here and he's going to bring us up to date on what's been happening here at Pulsar Fusion and be so kind as to reintroduce yourself to the viewers. Uh, hello again I'm Richard from Pulsar and it's very nice to have you back. Well thanks for being here so I we want to have a look over here I'm I'm intrigued with this vacuum chamber of yours over here and what you're doing with it can you please explain uh, this experiment you're running. Right so so this is an EP lab uh, and what's going on here as you can see is a Hall effect thruster test. So this is um, an HET firing argon it's a it's an it's like um, what's interesting it, it, it's it's got a lot of crossovers with fusion research. So it's plasma under an electromagnetic confinement, but at a low temperature, I say relatively low temperature um, compared to fusion research, but it's all still plasma physics. And that's why we have the ability in England to, to hire people who have the same, that crossover of, of skill set between uh, nuclear fusion. And this is, this is the business aspect of what we, the products we can sell today with that skill set. Um, so anyway, this is an HET test, currently firing argon in a just under five kilowatt uh, HET. So we're back here again on day two of our tour of the Pulsar Fusion facilities to get more in depth on the technical side of what they're doing here. Uh, would you be so kind, James, as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is James Lambert. I'm head of operations at Pulsar Fusion. I've been with the company ever since it was founded in 2019, and I work on mostly our work on electric propulsion, uh, specifically Hall effect thrusters, but also our work on fusion and hybrid rocket technologies as well. Well, we've, we've kind of seen some of the basics of what you do here um, yesterday and looking forward to seeing uh, this vacuum chamber. And I guess you have a Hall effect thruster installed in that chamber we as do. well. So let's go have a look at that. Sounds good. All right. So if you guys want to come over here and have a look. Um, This is one of the chambers we use for testing Hall effect thrusters. So we um, have another couple of these 
chambers on order, but this is what we do for most of our performance and lifetime testing of Hall Effect thrusters. Um, I'm sure it would be interesting if we can get in close there, I can take you through actually how a Hall Effect thruster works and approximately what it is. Um, so I tell you what, if I, um, if I just sort of squeeze in here, maybe you can see as much as you can. Uh, this is a Hall Effect thruster. It's a form of electric propulsion. So it functions by accelerating uh, particles of an inert gas to very high velocities to achieve propulsion that way. So it's very different from chemical propulsion where your, your energy source is also your propellant. Whereas with electric propulsion, the energy source is solar panels or nuclear reactor, wherever you're getting your electrical power from. And your propellant is something completely chemically inert. It's just there as mass to eject from the spacecraft. And the way this works is um, inside the Hall Effect thruster uh, are a series of electromagnetic coils. Just everyone's made these in school, right? You know, you wind a wire around uh, an iron nail and you, you have a strong magnetic field. Um, and we have a series of magnets around the outside and, along, and the inside here. And that creates a magnetic field that jumps across this gap like spokes on a bicycle wheel. And that magnetic field is used to trap a cloud of electrons. Those electrons are emitted from this cathode, they jump out, and they're trapped by that magnetic field. And this floating cloud of electrons uh, is then used to ionize a gas. As you inject gas into the back of that thruster, these gas molecules come out the back, collide with the electrons, and they lose their own electrons and become positively charged. Now that they're positively charged, uh, they are accelerated out of the thruster because the, the shower head basically at the back of the, uh, the thruster that they are injected through, the anode, is positively charged as well. And so that repels those ions out of the back of the thruster and that's what creates thrust. Now, the, um, the amount of thrust that you get, is that, does that directly correlate to the amount of energy that you're pumping through it? Which means that if you're channeling energy from a fission reactor versus just solar panels, are you going to get a lot more newtons of, of performance? Uh, absolutely. So the, what we're looking at here is about a one kilowatt Hall effect thruster it produces uh, perhaps 10 millinewtons. So a, a very small amount of force, perhaps, you know, the, Imagine that a piece of paper resting on your hand, right. a small amount of force. Um, but we're really interested in understanding how you scale these things up. So we're in the middle of a, a really interesting project funded by the UK Space Agency, uh, looking at what they call nuclear electric propulsion, where instead of having a bunch of solar panels, as you say, you have a fission reactor. And what if you have something like a megawatt of electricity you can feed into this device? What does that look like? And so we're investigating all kinds of interesting hard problems, like how do you distribute that electrical power efficiently in space where it's hard to dissipate heat? Um, how, do you, how do you actually batch these things? Is it better to build one enormous Hall Effect thruster or is it better to have a batch of 100 of them? And so there's a lot of really interesting engineering that we're working on with the UK Space Agency on this. Um, and this is actually one of our uh, early uh, innovative prototypes where we're using graphite as the heat shield instead of uh, more traditional boron nitride, which is a, a fun idea to play with. So that uh, makes it heavy, right? Uh, um, not, not especially heavy, um, okay. but one thing that the industry struggles with a little bit is, of course, when you launch space hardware, it's subject to a huge amount of vibration. Now, these devices produce plasma, these very hot gases, and plasma eats away terribly at basically all materials. So you have to find a material that stands up to contact with plasma quite well. And the industry standard is a material called boron nitride. And early on in our work, we got interested in saying, well, is there an alternative to boron nitride? Because it has the consistency of chalk. And chalk, of course, is not very vibration resistant. And so you have to do a lot of hard engineering to make sure that it'll survive launch. So we're interested in just trying out a few different ceramics to see if there was a, an alternative. And we pretty early came to the conclusion that no, boron is the, is the right material to be using, but we, we like to cast a wide net. In our early years, we like to cast a wide net on uh, uh, different solutions to these awkward problems. Now, if we're talking about really superheated plasma created by a fusion reaction, that sort of thing, um, my understanding is, is that you can't really contain it with materials anymore. The plasma has to be exclusively contained by electromagnetic fields. Is, 
Is that a pretty good assessment of how that works? That's 100% true. And in fact, we found that the best solution is don't try and find an, a, an improvement to boron nitride. Just refine the design of the magnetic field so that the plasma never makes contact with us in the first place. And that's a technology called magnetic shielding. And it's quickly becoming the industry standard uh, on whole effect thruster systems. Which is, which is the thing that's very interesting about Pulsar is we are a fusion company with uh, clients uh, and we sell products today to aerospace customers and deliver them on time uh, whilst continuing our research into fusion energy. So as, we've, as I've mentioned a couple of times in, in covering your company, you have a unique approach to handling this. You know, obviously the long-term objective is fusion propulsion, you know, yeah. going to Mars in a couple of weeks, those sorts of things. But in the meantime, you're selling, you know, ion thrusters and, and hybrid rocket engines to customers. You know, starting small, working your way up to big. What sort of clients would be interested in a Hall Effect thruster? Uh, okay, so... Everything in space, and you know there's more and more things going into space right now, all hardware needs propulsion. So obviously there's a launch which gets you from ground to low Earth orbit, and that's not what we do. But once you're in space, you need a different propulsion system to move you around, uh, to deorbit, um, to position yourself in the correct orbit, um, to uh, also to station keeping, so to keep yourself in the correct orbit. All these things, are, a rocket engine isn't suitable, and also these engines are amazingly efficient. So the thrust from an engine like this, it, it means that they can burn for very, you know, they give you uh, an, a, a reliable propulsion system for years, um, and it's very, very sensitive and very, very fine to get the, exactly the right positioning. And it, all of this hardware going into space needs a propulsion system, uh, and Hall Effect Thrusters is a very, very reliable, uh, efficient way of doing it. Um, the test is with argon, but we, we do a lot of uh, different gases. We do krypton and xenon for clients as well, but we're also in looking at condensable propellants as well. Um, but mainly Pulsar, this part of the facility is just testing, testing, testing. Um, and we do, we, we do research, but, but the main part of this area is just building engines for clients, testing them, and, um, and often we build in collaboration as well. Now, once again, I am definitely not an engineer nor a physicist or anything. Want to make sure that I understand this process for the base, uh, for the benefit of the viewers. What you do is you take an inert gas like xenon or krypton that you're talking, and you ionize it and make it into a plasma, and then drive it out the nozzle. Is that kind of how it works? It's a fusion research. The different, okay, with with fusion is again you're you're ionizing a gas, um, and you're you're using an electric charge to effectively rip the electrons off until you've got these ions, and that's what fusion is about. But then you're heating them up to a point where um, you're hoping that nature's you know, binding force, the strong force, will take over and, and lock those, um, uh, uh, well, if you're looking at protons and fusion together, and what, that's fusion, and, that, and that's trying to use, as I said, the strong force. Uh, this is electric propulsion, so what we're doing is at a much lower temperature is we're getting those ions and using an electromagnetic field to th throw those particles out the back of our engine, and it doesn't give you the same kind of, um, well, nothing like the, the, the power and speed you could get from fusion, but it's an ideal um, engine for current maneuvers in space. So fusion is the long-term moonshot. We want to do that. We're committed to that, um, and our own money goes into it, but to, on a daily basis, we're still building products that work today, putting them in space, testing them, and being part of the supply chain which I think is very important. I heard a huge figure earlier today when we were talking about how many engines you have on order with existing clients. Can you give me that number again? Uh, the, the figure we've got, I think, on our order books right now is it's just over 200 and I think it's 250, two, maybe even more engines. So there's a lot of people who need these engines. Um, and what's really important is it keeps... All our, you know, these vacuum facilities being a smaller chamber, that being, again, a sort of slightly smaller chamber, but all the same tech. And this is a large fusion, chamber for fusion. It's all the same gear, it's the same people, it's the same scientists, it's the same, you know, we still need the vacuum pumps, and that, it's that same core skill set. And actually, fusion scientists are, nobody has more pedigree to be working on something like Hall Effect thrusters, so. Fascinating, a really unique way of approaching it.
All right, so we are back in the clean room. Now, there's some promotional work going on here previously where Sophie was, was showing us uh, this thing, but oh. now we are all smocked up and, uh, and really want to get into the nitty gritty of this very big Hall Effect thruster. This is the biggest in Europe, is that correct? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so this was hooked up to a fission reactor. So, so take us through that process. That's the plan. So this is part of our UK Space Agency project, uh, and that's called the Nuclear Electric Propulsion Project. So the, the concept is you would have a fission reactor on your spacecraft that would deliver electrical power to your propulsion system. And so we thought, well, you know, if you have about a megawatt of electricity, what do you do with it? What sort of propulsion system do you run? And our proposed idea is you have a batch of these. Now this is a 10 kilowatt Hall Effect thruster, very much larger than the one we looked at uh, in the chamber earlier. Uh, but it is exactly the same in all other respects. It's a conventional Hall Effect thruster. It has an array of electromagnets contained in this outer shell, and it also has a strong electromagnet on the inside here. Uh, and it has the anode, which is at the base of this channel, which is where we feed through the uh, inert gas, whatever the propellant is, we're actually imagining using not something like xenon or krypton, not an inert gas, but rather a metal propellant or a, or a solid propellant that, right. can be, that can be vaporized through heating. That's, what we're, that's one of the concepts we're exploring in this project. Um, that's injected through the base of this anode uh, and then ejected because the anode is positively charged as before. So nothing has changed on, on that fundamental basis. It's just very big. It's just a really effect thruster. Now, um, I said earlier that Pulsar takes the quality of our fabrication extremely seriously. So maybe I'll, I should tell you a little bit about the work that's gone into sure, this please. to make it uh, such a fine product. So first of all, the channel, this is a, um, again, made from boron nitride, a very fragile chalk-like substance with incredible heat resistance. It's machined to better than a tenth of a millimeter precision. So a very, very fine fit and finish to this. Also, the anode is a very, very complex uh, piece of kit. It's, it, I mean, I, I, I disparagingly refer to it as a shower head because really it's taking gas or so, taking a fluid in and then dispersing it evenly. Right. But doing that in the vacuum of space and doing it efficiently is very, very difficult. So if you were to look at the cross section of this anode, it would be a very, uh, it's a very leveled, uh, multi-stage process of allowing the gas to pass through many different holes and channels to evenly distribute it. So this component was actually welded together from many different pieces using an electron beam inside a vacuum chamber. So this process called electron beam welding uh, is very sophisticated but incredibly flexible when you're building very subtle complex parts. I, it's amazing to me. So you, you made this here. This, yep. this whole thing was assembled here. It's just astonishing to me. This kind of incredibly detailed work that has, you know, just so consequential to the future of spaceflight right here in Milton Keynes. Um, that's right. That's yeah, exciting yeah. stuff. It's extraordinarily exciting. And I think it's um, a testament to how good the UK is at advanced manufacturing. Uh, that we're able to pull together this form of expertise. We either machine uh, the components in-house, and if there's something that, we're, that we can find someone else to do better, we'll outsource occasional bits of fabrication too. But we're very well served by the people around us. So tell me the difference uh, between NEP or nuclear electric propulsion yeah. and what uh, Rolls-Royce is working on right now, nuclear thermal. Mm. Um, you know, how, what's going to be the difference in terms of like exhaust velocity, ISP, that sort of thing, um, which is going to be superior in your opinion? You know, in the long run. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think the, th the sort of thing that people are looking at with uh, uh, like Rolls Royce, you know, they're looking at so this high, this thermal hydrogen type propulsion stuff. That's um, that's very much what I would classify as a high thrust uh, propulsion system. So it's not the most efficient, but if you need uh, many tens or hundreds of newtons of thrust to maneuver in space, that's an ideal solution. Uh, electric propulsion is always going to be a slightly lower thrust technology. Its real advantage is that it's extremely efficient. It makes use of a small amount of propellant in a very efficient way. So you don't have to launch, you don't have, you don't have to pay for launching all of that heavy propellant into space. Right. So for, for long space missions or for very challenging maneuvers, electric propulsion is almost certainly going to be the way you want to go. 
So let's, you know, obviously most people are thinking about the human mission to Mars. Obviously. Sure. And, and NASA, it certainly seems that NASA doesn't want to try to go to Mars without nuclear propulsion. They mm. want to cut down that transit yeah. time, reduce the chances of a solar storm, all those sorts of things. Do you think that nuclear thermal is going to have to be the way they have to go in order to push something as big as a human rated spacecraft? Or do you think this could be sized up to mm. something that big? 100% you can size this up. And we, we designed this always with the understanding that in, in reality, you would fly a batch of these Hall Effect thrusters uh, connected to your uh, fission reactor. So I think that it's almost certainly gonna be nuclear. Uh, the question is, what makes sense at the exact launch, with your exact launch schedule? Right. Uh, it might be that they prefer hydrogen, it might be that they go with something like EP. Fascinating. Well, show me some other things in this in this clean room. Then tell me about the process that uh, that your employees and technicians have to go through when uh, or what this clean room is used for. Yeah, I suppose the big thing. Yeah, I mean, why do you why do we assemble EP systems in clean rooms? Right. Uh, for many reasons. One of the main reasons is simply that we're worried about dirt getting into delicate parts of the propulsion system. That's really one of the biggest uh, concerns we have, and so assembling in a clean room makes a lot of sense. Um, also, we handle a lot of precision electronics. So a huge amount of work goes into things like the power processing and computer control systems. And we design and build those at Pulsar too. So you will see uh, a lot of our engineers handling printed circuit boards uh, and all kinds of delicate uh, static sensitive components. So again, we prefer to work in a clean environment wherever possible. Also, depending on who you're launching with, they sometimes have very different requirements. So ESA, for example, requires very high biological safety for the things that they launch as well. So if you're going to launch stuff into space on, an, on, a, on a European Space Agency mission, you need to convince them that there's no bacteria or fungi living in your hardware that could jeopardize the science of the mission in question. Gotcha. Fascinating stuff. And also you, you mentioned that you might expand this clean room. Can you yeah. tell me about that? Yeah, it really depends with really what our production rate is. But right. we're anticipating moving it out a good 15 to 20 meters through the rest of the workspace. Wow. Uh, just so we can get uh, greater throughput, so we can deliver more. Really, the, it's the assembly of electronics that we're finding is, the, is what's claiming up more and more of our clean room space, which is why you see uh, a lot of microscopes and electrical, uh, electrical tools here. It's mainly that. Uh, keeping dirt out of, uh, out of the propellant management system is a challenge, but you can, you can kind of fix it by putting stoppers in things and adopting clean practices. Uh, but the electronics needs a lot of clean, a lot of clean room space. Fantastic, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for this, James. Thank you. So we're just going to go ahead and wrap up here, Rich, in front of the biggest change that I've seen since I was here the last yep. time, and that is, of course, this massive vacuum chamber. Obviously, you're taking things to the next level. Please explain how you're doing that. Sure. Uh, so as you said, big vacuum chamber, not a rocket engine. Looks a bit like one. I'm sure you've seen Jordan standing in front of quite a few rockets. Um, this one, this is a very high vacuum chamber, much like the chambers you've seen in our EP lab. And it's specifically for doing fusion experiments in the configuration for propulsion in space. So we pump it down using very big vacuum pumps, just like the, the smaller vacuums behind us, um, until we get a high vacuum. Once we've done that, we'll start shaping the ports. So we'd be putting big lids on the front of these, on the front and back of this. And uh, it's very important that we get our vacuum right before we start putting all the ports in, because these things can be problematic. Once we've done that, we'll put our electromagnetic uh, coils in so that we can start producing a plasma, relatively low temperature plasma, so a couple of million degrees compared to the nothing like fusion uh, temperatures we're looking for at the beginning, just a low temperature plasma for shaping um, until we're comfortable that we can operate that chamber on that size, and then we'll start looking for higher temperatures and, and you know pushing that towards the temperatures required, closer required for fusion. Um, the important thing for us is, is with, when it comes to fusion research is to test to scale, because you start doing these experiments on sort of desktops, it's less relevant to some of the aerospace clients that we're currently talking to. We want to see these things demonstrated to scale, um, and so that's why we, you know, we're moving to these large-scale chambers, and we look forward to doing a demonstration with our first plasma here, 
and we'd be very much opening the doors to you again and hoping you can come and look at the computers and, and see, it, see it running. So uh, yeah, it's the first step towards larger fusion research uh, for, again, specifically propulsion in space. And once again, to reiterate, you don't actually need to create a power positive fusion reaction in order for this to work, right? You just essentially need to create the plasma, the, the propellant in the equation, but you don't need to, to achieve that magical um, power you positive. Right, exa exactly. Right. There. Uh, right. The, the main reason you're doing this is because the biggest uh, requirements in any fusion reactor, if you see things like ITER, it's a massive, massive vacuum chambers, um, the size of a mountain sometimes. Uh, and space is a vacuum. So your biggest components uh, are, you know, you've, you've got that vacuum. And, and plasma, it, you have to have a very high vacuum to get the kind of results we're looking for. So that's a really big going thing going for you in space. The second thing is the superconducting magnets. Here you have to pump nitrogen through them, liquid nitrogen, to get them really, really cold because magnets just work, magnets work better at a low temperature. Uh, space is zero Kelvin, right, it's minus 275 degrees, which is ideal, again, an ideal place for, for operating um, superconductors. Um, and on top of that is that, without going too much into the science of it, uh, toroidal reactors have got something, they've got a slight problem, in fact, of bomb diffusion, where everything is being pushed to the outside of the chambers. That's why stellarators were invented, which give you that sort of figure of eight, trying to drive those ions back into the center of the reactor. If you can use something which has straight electromagnetic field lines, Particles that are these ions, they actually like to corkscrew around straight electromagnetic field lines. And that's not ideal for energy because you don't know what to do with the, with the end of your chambers. Um, but when you're using it for propulsion, actually having leaky electromagnetic fields is not, at, because you're not trying to use it for energy and you're, you have a different end game in mind, uh, linear propulsion, uh, linear fusion devices are ideal for propulsion. Um, our main uh, fuel pair that we're looking at is helium-3 and deuterium. Um, we won't be trying to do that on, on the ground here. This is a static test. And again, it's to check that we can get all the criteria right uh, before we then look to do a hot test. And then we would we'd try and fund an in-orbit demonstration uh, eventually. But it's, it's bit by bit. But we do want to do the first fusion tests in space. Um, and if you could ask me where would you like to do a fusion experiment on Earth or in space, it would be in space. And 10 years ago, that would be a very, you know, people would say, what, how are you going to do a fusion experiment in space? But now, SpaceX putting heavy equipment into space every Tuesday um, is suddenly very feasible. So test it on the ground, test at low temperature, test at a higher temperature, test it in space. Well, I'll tell you something, Rich. Um, you know, if I may say what's always impressed me about your company from the beginning. It's first of all a methodical method of getting to your end game, but also your philosophy of getting customers, getting revenue on the books first before you get to that long-term objective. I think that gives you a fantastic chance for success. So I wish you all the best and thank you so much for your time today. But this isn't it, guys. We have more content in this tour coming up soon. I had to make a part two, so I look forward to showing all of that to you. Thank you so much, Pulsar Fusion, for this incredible opportunity. Please like, please subscribe. Also, please consider joining this channel on Patreon. You can check the description for all the details on that so I can do more tours like this in the future. And as always, stay angry about space.